Hello everyone! Welcome to my next review video for Quantum Leap 2022. To start off this episode, I'd like to give a big shout out to the people who took the time to watch, like, and comment on my last two videos, and to those who've subscribed to my channel. Way more people watched them than I thought ever would, and I hope you've all been enjoying them. At the time of this writing, there's a few comments I'd like to react to. James Woods says that he really likes the new show, and the fact that Ben and Addison are a couple instead of Sam, who slept with different women while his wife knew about it. I hear what you're saying, James, but it wasn't like Sam was answering a booty call every other week. It only happened a few times. Keep in mind, when Sam first leaped, he was single. He ended up changing Donna's life in episode 2, but didn't remember that it worked. In the future, Donna knew that if Sam remembered her, he wouldn't be able to be effective as a leaper. Terry Lays points out that Sam and Al might know what it looks like to leap, given that in episode 6 of season 2, Al started glowing when he was standing next to a high-powered antenna. That's a good point, but Sam clearly didn't know what a leap looked like in the last episode, so maybe Al is the only one who sees it, or maybe Sam's memory had been partially erased. Who knows? John Sumner likes seeing more of the present slash future, but wishes it was set further in the future than today. The problem with that idea is that for Quantum Leap to work, it has to be within Ben's lifetime, according to Sam's original string theory. If Ben is in his early 40s and his time is in the 2040s, then he can really only leap from the year 2000 onward. It doesn't give the nostalgia factor that us millennials slash zillennials would crave from a show like this. I'm also not sure I'd like to see a show set in the near future, given how crazy the last 10 years have been. Like, would you have predicted in 2012 that this is what 2022 would be like? I know I couldn't. Who knows what 2040 is going to be like? Okay, enough with the mushy stuff. Let's get into my review and recap of Episode 3, Season 1 of Quantum Leap 2022, entitled Somebody Up There Likes Ben. We start with my hated, cheap, rotating leap in effect, and Ben finds himself in a boxing ring getting the crap beat out of him by a sparring partner. His trainer, who refers to Ben as his little brother, sends him to the showers, and a poster on the wall identifies the trainer as... Jim the Hammer Shapiro. No, boxer Daryl the Hammer Hill. He takes a moment to admire his muscular reflection in the locker room when Addison makes a quip revealing her presence. It's not quite a bathroom like in the first two episodes, but her showing up in these sorts of places is starting to make her a little suspicious. Ben asks why he hasn't returned to 2022 yet, and Addison says they're still trying to understand the code Ben added before he leaped. Ben impresses Addison with his ability to read a poster on the wall to get his name, Danny Hill, the city he's in, Las Vegas, and the decade, 1970s. She fills in that it's October 2nd, 1977, and he realizes he's leaped into a fighter whose title bout is the following day. Despite Ziggy running slow, Addison looks up the original history and reveals that Danny appeared distracted and lost the fight. His career never recovered. Before they can figure out what was distracting him, a woman runs into the locker room and starts sucking face with Ben, much to Addison's barely detectable chagrin. Daryl walks in and scolds the girl, whose name is Angela, and kicks her out so she doesn't distract him. After Daryl leaves, Ben remarks that he always wanted a brother, which unlocks the memory that he was an only child, but he doesn't remember anything else. We get some B-roll footage of 1970s Vegas before we see Daryl and Ben heading to the weigh-in for the match. In this scene, Ben and Addison are talking as they walk, without Addison falling off the cerebral platform, and Ben seems to be using his regular speaking voice. He's quite close to Daryl, but Daryl seems to be ignoring the fact that his little brother is talking to thin air. Whatever. Daryl gives Ben a pep talk to calm his nerves before weigh-in, and they go inside. At the weigh-in, it's revealed that Danny's flame, Angela, is his opponent's girlfriend. Addison goes to Ian and starts making a list of demands for what data she needs in order to teach Ben to box and find any weaknesses his opponent, reigning champ Roy Gordon, might have. Ian shuts her up and does a mental wellness check on her, which she fails. She talks about how she isn't sleeping and how on Wednesdays she and Ben would get Thai food and watch Real Housewives of Beverly Hills. Like any good Chekhov's gun, this is important for later. Ian reveals to the audience that he has a nicer manicure than her, and then tells her to get some sleep. Addison is all, nah, it'll be fine. So Ian just says some reassuring words to her. Magic summons them to his office for morning stand-up, where he reveals that the Pentagon has been looking at their power bill and knows that something is up, and this is going to be a problem because he hasn't told them about Ben yet. 
Ian reports that he has deciphered some of Ben's code and that its purpose is to get him to a specific moment in space-time, along with a cryptic path through space-time. Ian reveals that this episode's leap is special because, with it being in 1977, Ben has now leaped outside his lifetime. Security woman Jen points out that leaping outside one's own lifetime is supposed to be impossible. Ian reveals that as part of Ben's upgrade, he got rid of all the safety protocols, so nothing is impossible now. I'm a little bit confused at this part, to be honest. In the original series, Sam's string theory was that your life was like a string, with one end being your birth and the other end being your death. If you connect the ends and travel fast enough, you'll loop back into the past. If you ball the string up, the days of your life touch out of order, allowing you to move to random days within your lifetime. Thus, it would be impossible by the nature of the theory to travel outside your lifetime. It wasn't a matter of a safety protocol built into the Quantum Leap Accelerator or anything like that. And I'd like to note here that in the original series, Sam did leap into dates before his birth in a few episodes, and generally it was explained as special circumstances. Addison asks how many leaps Ben needs to reach his destination. Ian reveals that the number is roughly the number of episodes that would fill a season or two. Hint, hint. Addison wants to tell Ben he's not coming home anytime soon, but Magic doesn't want to upset him given that his motives are still unknown. <laughs> Addison announces that she'll give Ben the news after the bout. Back in 77, Ben is trying to get Daryl to delay the fight, but is unable to sway him. Daryl reveals that keeping his gym is dependent upon the outcome of the fight, then leaves to get the car before Ben can inquire further. While Ben is waiting, the champ shows up with his entourage, and Roy reveals that he knows about Danny and Angela. Daryl pulls up and they start to drive away, but one of Roy's goons calls Daryl a baby killer, some reference to his time in Vietnam, and that makes Daryl get out of the car and start beating on the posse. Ben intervenes and gets Daryl to leave with him. When they reach the gym, Addison returns but has to stop talking because Ben and Daryl are having a serious conversation. Daryl reveals he ran out of money months ago and borrowed against the gym with a loan shark to make ends meet. He didn't want anyone to know and believes everything will be fine once Danny wins the fight. Ben asks what will happen if he loses, but Daryl walks away in denial of the possibility. Addison reveals that Danny loses the fight, Daryl sells the gym, and then kills himself shortly after, so now they believe that Ben is there to save Daryl, a fact that Ziggy had completely missed. In 2022, Ian reveals that he's figured out some of Ben's plan. He describes how the space probe Voyager 2 used gravitational assists to build up enough momentum to leave the solar system. He believes Ben is doing something remarkably similar graphically in order to build up some sort of temporal momentum to leap back further in time than was previously possible. Addison interrupts the revelation to nag at Ian because he's not doing enough to figure out why Ziggy is running slow or why Ziggy had missed the reason for Ben's leap. She also refers to Ziggy as it in this scene. Ziggy was originally referred to as a he by Al, but at some point switched genders to she, and when we finally meet her in season four, she's voiced by Deborah Pratt, who is an executive producer of the Revival series and an ex-wife of creator Donald Belisario. Back in his office, Ian reveals that there is indeed something slowing Ziggy down. He sets up a firewall, which really should have been there the whole time, and says that until their diagnostics are complete, Ziggy might not work so great. Addison apologizes for snapping at Ian and complains about the limitations of being a hologram. Ever a source of strength and wisdom, Ian points out that as a hologram, there's a lot she can do. Back at the gym in 1977, Ben is working out when Penny, Daryl's wife, shows up to talk to Danny. She confides that she knows something is up with Daryl, and Ben tries to put her mind at ease. She then leaves, leaving behind some sandwiches for Daryl and Danny. Ben decides that he cares about these people and wants to win the fight for them, and asks Addison how to do that. And Addison says this. You might be Ben, but you have leapt into the body of a professional fighter. A body that's strong, a body that's trained and lightning fast. When you hit, it's not Ben's fist Roy Gordon's going to feel. It's Danny's. What the actual ever-living fudgesicle. Oh man, I am going to spend some time on this. Now this show has played a little fast and loose with established canon. Hand-waving away the within one's own lifetime limitation was irksome to me, but this scene here is where Addison drops the bomb that completely floored me. Why do I take such offense to this scene? Because Addison just said that Ben was inside Danny's body and that he had Danny's strength and muscle memory. The original series, aside from a few ambiguous lines, clearly established that Sam's body and mind is physically in the past, and some unexplained phenomenon allows others around him to see and hear the person he leaps into. 
Sometimes the process was wonky and Sam would retain memories, but it was still always Sam. Cite my sources, you say? Fine, let's review some evidence. In Another Mother, his host's young daughter can see both Sam and Al. If it was just Sam's mind, she'd only see her mom. Sam can't see the Leapy's body when he looks at himself. He can only see them in a reflection. When Sam leapt into a pregnant woman, both her and the baby went to the future while everyone still saw a pregnant woman. Sam fathered a child, Sammy Joe Fuller, genetically his daughter in the trilogy episodes. In fact, she ended up working at Project Quantum Leap in the 1990s. I'd kind of hope she'd be referenced in this series. She still might. When Sam first encountered evil leaper Aaliyah, they were able to see each other as they are after touching. And when we last see evil leaper Aaliyah, she was shot in the stomach by Zoe mid-leap, but the bullet leapt out with her body and the leapy returned unharmed. Ditto for evil leaper Zoe, who Thames had Lothos leap out after Sam shot her, returning the warden who was unharmed, much to everyone's confusion. And the most damning of all is the episode where Sam leapt into an amputee war veteran. Sam still had his legs, and when he got up and walked around, you saw a floating guy. In conclusion, Sam's body went back in time, not just his mind. Alright, I'm done with that rant, back to the episode review. In 2022, security woman Jen shows Magic some files she's dug up. One unintelligible document, one obvious DNA profile with the confusing page title of Time Analysis, and a document showing the light spectrum with a page title of Quantum Spectrum Analysis, whose content looks like it was lifted from existing scholarly articles. She reveals to Magic that Ben has been working on the new code for six months prior to his first leap. He'd been sneaking out on conferences and other things for his side project, and now Jen has to interview Addison and knows it'll be tough on her. Back at the gym, Addison reminds Ben that he has a photographic memory, though I believe the correct modern term for that is an eidetic memory, and reveals that the 2022 team configured the imaging chamber to create a hologram of the original fight. They determined that there was an opportunity that Danny missed in round two that could have won him the fight, so all Ben has to do is reenact the fight exactly the way it originally went so that he can win in round two. Ben starts practicing to learn the routine with Addison. I don't know why he doesn't just go and occupy hologram Danny's position so that he's learning the moves and motions from the original fighters with correct heights and perspectives, but whatever. Ben complains that he's a righty and Danny's a lefty, so all the moves feel off. Of course, if he's just in Danny's body and has Danny's muscle memory, you'd think the left-handedness would come naturally, but hey, I'm not the one who just painted the series into this corner. Even with an eidetic, sort of photographic memory, the idea that Ben will be able to replicate the first round exactly and not introduce any differences that could change Roy's strategies seems to violate Lehman's concepts of quantum mechanics. But he continues practicing over and over with Addison while she gets angrier and angrier at him. Ben expresses concern that she looks exhausted, and she freaks out until she faints and engages Ben in a holographic trust fall that he naturally fails at, because she's a hologram. Not quite sure why she disappears here. It would seem that her being conscious is not relevant to the imaging chamber's operation. Maybe Ian or Jen pulled the plug when she blacked out. Addison wakes up in sickbay where Magic tells her she's suffering from dehydration and exhaustion. He sentences her to two hours of sleep. In the meanwhile, Ian has found out what's been making Ziggy slow. Remember that hard drive and thumb drive of unknown provenance from the last episode that they just plugged into everything? Pepperidge Farm remembers. And doing that installed a Trojan that gave Janice Calavici the backdoor she needed to access Ziggy remotely. Ian can't sever her connection without a full system reboot, which would take a week because computers, I guess. And Magic says to keep things going so they can support Ben. Ian says that Janice's connection allows her to access data, but she can't control Ziggy because she doesn't have any Ziggy-approved tech. That's another Chekhov's gun, by the way. And speaking of the devil, we see Janice go visit her mom, Beth. She brings Beth a bottle of wine to hang out and chat, but Beth wants tea. Janice makes them tea and sits down to chat, accusing her mother of being the reason that she wasn't accepted into Project Quantum Leap. Ben confirms this, stating that it was out of concern that her daughter would waste her talents on an unachievable goal. Janice has a very villainous, you shouldn't have doubted me speech, and demands everything of Al's that was related to the project. Beth refuses, but realizes that she's been drugged before collapsing. Addison returns to Ben and lets him know that she's okay. Daryl walks in and sees the sandwiches, realizing his wife Penny had come by but didn't want to talk to him. 
He starts acting paranoid and Addison says that he's showing symptoms of PTSD, revealing that she served in Afghanistan, which isn't relevant to the rest of this episode. Ben tries to talk to Daryl, but the police show up to arrest Daryl for assaulting Roy's goons. Ben talks Daryl down into surrendering peacefully to the police. Addison reveals that Daryl gets into a fight in prison and is held for 72 hours, missing the fight. In order to help Daryl, Ben calls the cops pigs, and he gets arrested too. This gets Daryl out of jail for the fight, but Addison reveals that Daryl still kills himself a few months later. Ben realizes that whether he wins or not, Daryl was going to kill himself, so Ben tells Daryl that he will not fight unless Daryl pinky swears to see a doctor about his PTSD. Daryl agrees, so off they go. At the fight, Ben uses his eidetic memory to replicate the original round one. When we get to the opening in round two, he takes the shot that Danny originally missed and knocks the champ down. Everyone's cheering, but the champ gets back up off the mat at the last second. Ziggy's still running too slow to give any advice, so Ben turns to Daryl. He gets some shots in, but the champ rallies and gives Ben a few good shots to the face, which knocks him down. While on the mat, Ben suddenly has memories of being in bed with a woman. He manages to get up and almost gets TKO'd by saying his name is Ben Song to the ref or umpire or whatever boxing matches have. I, I don't know. I'm not a fan of pugilism. In between rounds, Addison suggests that Ben switch stances to right-handed since he's right-handed. Daryl agrees with this approach but warns Ben that he'll only have one shot at the ruse before Roy figures out what's going on. Is that series creator Donald Belisario sitting ringside? Anyhow, the round begins, Ben starts off left-handed to mislead the champ, then lays him out with some punches from his right arm. Ben wins the fight and everyone is happy, except the champ, I guess. He lost, but we don't care about him. Ben confirms Daryl's promise to get help and receives the championship belt, which kind of sucks for Danny because he'll have missed the greatest moment of his life. Oh well, that's the price you pay for having someone else take over your body. Ugh. After the fight, Ben is hanging out in the ring. Weirdly, everyone's gone home, but all the lights are still on. Whatever. I guess they were just more wasteful in the 70s. She shows Ben a photo taken ringside after the fight of Daryl, Danny, and their significant others, and gives Ben the happily ever after wrap-up. However, Addison also has to give Ben the bad news that he isn't coming home soon because his new code has him following a path that they don't understand. Ben asks Addison the weird question of, will you still leap with me, instead of something more correct like, will you still be there during my leaps, or will you still be there with me, and tells her that he needs her, which makes her all warm inside. He also tells Addison about the memory fragment that he had while knocked down, but he leaps before he figures out who the person with him in the memory was, which we already know is Addison. Back in 2022, Addison is at home alone watching Real Housewives when the rest of the team shows up with Thai food and Ian showing off all his awesome tats. They're having an awesome friend montage until Magic gets a phone call from Beth. Beth informs him of Janice's visit and reveals that Al had some things from the project that he wasn't supposed to have kept, including his original hand link for Ziggy, which we see Beth has jacked into her secret lair. We also see that she's clearly working on a replica of Epcot Center in Disney World or the Science Center in Vancouver. We then get the high-tech zoom out from Ben's eye, finding him sitting in a bar with 80s music playing and wearing an outfit from Flashdance. Looking in the mirror, he sees he slept into a brunette being hit on by some bar creep. The end. So what are my thoughts about this one? The 1977 plot was okay. Nothing to write home about. It kind of reminds me of the original series season 1 episode, The Right Hand of God, which was more clever. Sam leaped into a boxer who had been throwing fights. Since Sam was a physicist and out of shape, he couldn't box. So there's a long, Rocky-like training montage where the nun whips Sam back into shape. I don't think it was explicitly stated, but it felt like this was God, time, or fate purposefully putting Sam in that position to make him more able to tackle the physical demands of future leaps. This would have been a great opportunity to whip Ben into shape in a similar fashion. Instead, they just hand wave it away by saying Ben is in Danny's body and now is in great shape. I'm still really irked that they completely changed the rule about leaping and now Ben's mind is just inhabiting people's bodies. I guess that's why we haven't seen the waiting room in 2022, because there's no one there. Boy, is it going to suck when Ben leaps into an old man or an amputee or a chimpanzee. The 2022 storyline gets more complicated, with Janice drugging her mom to retrieve Al's hand link so we can all get the member berry at the end. You know what would have been a more clever way for Janice to get her hands on a hand link? In the Season 4 opener The Leap Back, Sam and Al are struck by lightning and simultaneously leap. 
Al leaps into the body of a returning war hero in 1945, and Sam is returned to the imaging chamber back in 1999. A subplot of that episode is the fact that the imaging chamber is sealed shut and can only be opened from inside with the hand link, which traveled with Al back to 45. Ultimately, the hand link is left in the possession of Tom Jarrett and Suzanne Elsinger in the past. It would have been really cool if Janice tracked it down through an estate sale or by robbing a grandchild's house, etc. But no. To make it easier for an audience that might not have seen the original series, they just say Al kept one in a box in his house. When it comes to the mystery and intrigue with what's going on in 2022, I really feel like they're just rushing the mysteries. There's almost no time between when we're introduced to a mystery and when it's concluded. In the pilot episode, they discover the strange woman is helping Ben, but by the end of the episode, we know it's Janice Calavici. In episode two, we see Ben's code turn into some sort of map, which you would think would take them days to even understand, but within seconds, they figure out that it's showing a destination. The clues aren't even given time to simmer with the audience before they're outright answered. Kinda reminds me of this. My mother's dead and I killed her. Here's the weapon and cuff me, thank you very much. So that's my recap and review of episode three. Is the series getting better? Is it getting worse? Is it staying true to the original lore or is it just doing its own thing and banking on the member berries? Let me know what you think in the comments below. Please like, subscribe and share and thank you for watching. As always, I'll see you in the future. Edison!